Great. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And uh, thank you for joining us on this, um, what I regard as immensely important question of locally led adaptation. Um, we see the ravages of climate change affecting communities across the globe in developed and developing countries. But of course, developing countries are much more vulnerable both to the impacts and also are less prepared or able to facilitate adaptation and build resilience of communities. So uh, the CIFAR Alliance, uh, um, uh, alongside Microsave and indeed many others around the world have been looking at how we might enable and enhance locally led adaptation. And we are going to focus on two aspects of this today that are covered in the white paper that the CIFAR Alliance and MSC have just released, asking what role can blended finance and digital technologies play in uh, enhancing and uh, enabling locally led adaptation. So our agenda is, first of all, to hear from Wendy Chamberlain, who is actually up in a um, climate vulnerable area of northern Kenya right now, um, and so kindly recorded a video for us. Um, and then uh, Eric from CARE will talk uh, about what they're doing with their VSLAs and how that might fit into locally led adaptation. I will then give you a quick overview of the white paper um, and then my colleague Arjun will outline plans for the next step and the learning agenda that, that we have. And hopefully we'll be able to have a good 20 minutes or so for discussion. So with that, and hoping that this somewhat lengthy preamble has allowed enough people to join, um, we will hear from Wendy. Hi everyone, my name is Wendy Chamberlain. I'm a Vice President for Research and Advisory at Busara. We're a behavioral science firm based in Nairobi, Kenya. I'm really grateful to my colleagues at MSE for letting me share a few thoughts on why I think this topic of looking at the role that financial services can play in supporting the ambitions of locally led adaptation is so important. There's a few things that I think about when I think about what we're trying to achieve with financial inclusion and what we can learn from efforts around locally led adaptation. So often the solutions we pursue around financial inclusion are about treating a specific problem and hoping that the solutions can be scaled. I think what we learn from locally led efforts is that context matters. What works in one community for one purpose may not be the same solution that works in another community. We also learn that people's lives are financially complex. And so often we can forget this when we're pursuing scale right away as a path to solutions. Instead, it serves us well to remember the complexity of people's lived experiences and thinking about how we can better perhaps listen to local communities about what they need financial services to do for them to be most supportive of their ambitions, most supportive of their ability to adapt and to become resilient to climate shocks and stresses. I think what we may also potentially miss and we have the opportunity to learn from from locally led efforts is that while solutions may, may be unique to context, our approach to listening and our approach to designing solutions may be what can scale. So how we approach listening to customers about what their priorities are, how we approach bringing in the private sector, bringing in the public sector to participate in these conversations may be a part of that effort as well. I hope the rest of this conversation goes well and that we look forward just to hearing more about what you're doing to engage with local communities as part of your efforts to see how financial services can support their efforts to pursue climate adaptation and resilience. Thanks so much, bye. So thank you so much to Wendy um, uh, for her thoughts. She was at COP28 and came, came back enthused about the role of uh, community participation in locally led adaptation. And uh, that sets uh, Eric up very nicely to talk about the outstanding work that CARE have been doing 
uh, on this on this issue in the context of their VSLAs. Eric, over to you, and just say next slide when you need me to advance. Oh, all right. Oh, uh, thank you, Graham. Oh, thank you. And it's a uh, it's a pleasure to be here presenting. Um, just to you know, echo a lot of what Wendy said is um, uh, focuses on the work that we're doing at Care with our VSLAs. Um, we have just piloted a project called the Digital Care Package, and this uh, next slide, sorry. This project is all about creating inclusive partnerships with local organizations to develop uh, digital programming that, that works with our VSLA groups. Um, it focuses on access to affordable devices, digital literacy, relevant tools, and addressing the gender norms around technology. Um, so one of the key things we found is that we need to have the feedback from the local community. So like we run our Women Respond initiative, which is targeting, get, gathering information directly from our participants who are the women in, in our VSLA groups to understand their needs so that we can now customize our solutions to, to fit the day-to-day the -day needs of these VSLA groups. Um, so it's it's very locally led based in, in the fact that we're getting feedback from the women we work with. We're making sure that this is all relevant to what they're doing. And then we're going out to try and source and and, and customize solutions with local partners to, to meet these needs. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so some of the challenges that the, the women highlighted were the the cost and logistics around access to devices. This has been a big issue and it, it, it goes across across the board for any programs that are trying to encourage digital inclusion. Um, looking at training, the soft skills needed to, to, to train both trainers from local communities and the, the participants of the programs to ensure that they actually understand how to use the tools and devices that we're bringing into their, their communities. Um, looking at tech tech users, creating digital solutions that cater to those basic mobile phones, basic mobile needs of these communities. So like trying to find partners who understand that the last mile that we're trying to reach don't always have access to the smartphones and such. And then um, obviously navigating the gender dynamics around um, technology. It's very culturally sensitive in some areas where the the local representation of how women interact with technology is misunderstood, and so it's it's a the balance of making sure that we are careful when while introducing tools and considerate to the all parties involved in in the in the programming, um, and then coordinating with reliable partners. Um, that's that's a key key aspect of this. Next slide. So our solution is on making sure that everything is relevant. And this is done through, as I said, speaking to women, understanding their needs and finding the partners that can customize these solutions to them. Um, one thing we, we highlighted was that among our VSLA groups, we have different personas. So we have to make sure that we make sure we make sure that everything that we're doing is addressing the needs of these different personas. So we have the rural women who need uh, tools that are uh, easily accessible, affordable, and can be used used without too much training that is that is necessary in in term in terms of, of like adapting to smartphone technology and such. So. Um, we have enterprising women who have solutions. We, we have to customize solutions to enhance their business capabilities and uh, in, 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 in what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, the ambitious hustlers who are now looking at, you know, scaling their businesses and moving into enterprise. How can we customize tools that are going to help them get digitally inclusive to the financial systems that, and allow them to like scale accordingly? And then the resilient refugees who face issues with uh, cash transfers, issues around security. So the tools have to be customized to make sure that they all fit the needs of these groups. Uh, next slide. So our key concept here is locally led partnerships, finding people who are going to be 
focused on addressing the same issues, um, partnering with organizations that are looking at creating, uh, overcoming the device accessibility barriers that women face, um, innovative financing models that that allow them the women to like have asset financing for for devices, um, digital financial. Uh, tools for VSLA groups. So looking at, at tools that are relevant to the group's day-to-day -day needs. So how can we use these to introduce them to uh, record keeping? How can we enhance their operational efficiency and cut down on the the, the, the drastic sp expenditure that they have on the paper ledgers, which also is a climate issue. Um, and then the private partnership the public-private synergies with digital inclusion. Um, collaborate with local governments to ensure that we are lobbying to 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 change the the views around pricing for you know aspects like um, mobile money, data data costs, and harnessing this the private sector's capability for for good for the public good and to show how they are included in in boosting the work that we're doing. To, to, to include these communities into the digital ecosystems. And then obviously layering all this into our programs across the board. So making sure that this is something that we, we, we implement in different programs, that being agriculture, health sector, um, climate change, whatever we're working in, how can we build this type of strategic partnership across the board? Um, next slide. And then, uh, the second aspect is the digital financial transaction. So we work with um, local mobile partner, local mobile networks uh, who have mobile money. We're looking at look the local banks. We're using agency banking to create a more accessible path for for the VSLA group members, uh, so that they can now start using these these systems. And meeting them where they are, because in in a lot of cases it's hard for groups to open to go out and open bank accounts because it requires a lot of documentation, sometimes collateral to get loans. So how can we work with the, our local partners to start viewing these communities as actual customers and not just a CSR initiative that that has been the case for for the past few years? Um. So like in an example of this, it would be like. Uh, we have a digital sub wallets program that has shown um, amazing results on how people can save to specific needs. And we're trying to work with partners like MTN and Airtel to build this into their mobile money um, wallet uh, operating system. So the USSD menus. So people can now be saving money on these digital platforms towards specific needs. And then by, by partnering with these local organizations, it's also teaching them how to influence the way that uh, our participants use their, their tools. Being able to clearly articulate what's available on these platforms for the groups to use. So on the mobile money menus, understanding how to use the agency banking networks, understanding how to set up mobile money accounts and working directly with them to, to, to participate in the long term. Um, so uh, next slide. I guess we're at the end. <laughs> I was <laughs> I, being time sensitive. And yeah, so in conclusion, um, our commitment is to, you know, rely on local community involvement and the digital inclusivity for us to achieve sustainable fin financial empowerment. We're committed to collaborating with our local partners. We're committed to delivering tailored solutions that respect the unique needs and of these communities, breaking down the barriers and building a foundation for sustainable growth. Um, yeah, that's that's what we're doing with the digital care package. And thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Eric. Really appreciate it. And uh, also for your time sensitivity. That's that's really good. Now you've put the challenge out to me to uh, uh, do the same. So. Uh, as I said, uh, the CFR Alliance and, and MSC have been working on uh, a, a locally led adaptation white paper. And I want to just quickly start by just reiterating why we think this is so important. Um, this is from work that we did in, in, in Bihar in Northern uh, India, 
talking to farmers about how flooding has affected their livelihoods. And you can see that the trend uh, is upwards, but the flooding has also been significantly enhanced by additional climate-driven challenges of drought and heat waves. And this has also had secondary effects that have affected, for example, uh, pest infestation. And when we went to Nigeria with the CODIS um, to look at what the impacts of these were, we analyzed it using the uh, DFID five capitals approach and looked at what was happening. And what we see is a relentless, relentless erosion of the five capitals, with the exception of this brief upward tick where the government um, uh, helped with water access um, in, the, in the area of Nigeria that we were looking at in Bugu. Um, everything else from natural resources to financial resources to social networks and relationships and the human skills, all of them have seen this, uh, this relentless erosion which the, the, the people themselves attribute to the changing climate. So this is a really critical issue that is beginning to impact vulnerable communities um, very, very significantly. So then I go running to, um, you know, some of the climate modeling portals to look at what what they say and of course um the answer to that is you know it's it's very scary and we see you know very significant impacts likely to occur in a wide variety of uh, areas i've given just one example here of um of tanzania and you can see that soil water stress is going to have very very significant impacts um and also, uh, similarly, you can see from the World Bank that uh, a lot of the heat stress that will occur. And what I want you to see here is that both of these are on the basis of RCP 4.5, which essentially is the is the current um, trajectory that the that we're on because we're not doing enough to mitigate the impacts of climate change. And this is going to be. Uh, you know, this is the scenario that they're projecting for 2050. But the issue with these climate models is that they just are not, you know, they go down to sort of district level at best, and they're not precise enough for uh, helping local communities uh, uh, adapt to climate change. So we really need... a, 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 a a completely different approach, obviously informed by these climate models, but we need to look at what the lo hyper local realities are because how climate change affects someone at the top of the hill is very different quite often to how it will affect people at the bottom of that hill. Um, so, you know, we're going to need to help them with adaptation to protect their livelihoods. Uh, and the shared infrastructure that, that supports those and also overcome the social uh, obstacles. So locally led adaptation is about local government working with community based organizations in order to diagnose, plan, implement and monitor adaptation strategies. And that that combination of local government and the local community is, is where the magic happens, so to speak. Now, this is really about inverting um, the the uh, the story of, of decentralization. And what I mean by that is, the, increasingly, there have been efforts to decentralize uh, government and respond much better at a subnational level to the requirements and needs of, you know, more localized communities. So, so locally led adaptation takes. Um, you know, starts instead of pushing down from the, from the central government, works with locally led uh, climate change plans that, as I say, are, are built from uh, a, a collaboration between local government and, and community-based organizations like CARE and, and many others. Um, and then feeds that information back up 
aggregates it and then hopefully is able to access money from the Green Climate Fund and other multilateral funds that are designed to support locally led adaptation. And done well, this should improve accountability and buy-in at the local uh, level. It should increase flexibility, obviously increase participation, and indeed the responsiveness of uh, adaptation plans to real local needs. So one approach that, that we postulate that um, might be might be helpful um, is to, to break it down into a series of um, uh, uh, subparts. So the first piece is to really understand the facts, uh, the factors that impact the, the, the locally led adaptation strategy you're going to build. So that's obviously the regulatory and, and policy environment. Government's planned adaptation uh, measures, so obviously the, the national adaptation plan or climate uh, adaptation plans. Also to look at uh, climate data and forecasts, even though, as I said, they tend to be too high level, they do pro provide overviews of what is going to be most you know, sensitive and difficult to deal with. And then obviously the financial services landscape, if we're going to help these communities with financial services, to respond to the locally led uh, adaptation plans. So then there's this big participatory planning process where we go through essentially five steps, situation analysis, looking at desired future, then analyzing the barriers, looking at pathways to get to that future, and then finally looking at how we might finance that future. And those five components taken together should give us the locally led adaptation strategy with the purpose and the timing and how long it is and who acts and who, who benefits and who is affected, um, as well as the financing strategy. And I hope moving forward, the, the role for digital technology. But obviously a plan alone, a strategy alone isn't enough and we need to move to implementation. And, and that's where I think, you know, what I call governance and institutional arrangements, so risk analysis, participatory monitoring frameworks, and so on, come into play. And in amongst all of this are really important feedback loops, both between that governance uh, system and also because uh, with these plans, they need to feed back up into the national uh, climate change plans as well, so that they influence how the national level um, is thinking about it. Because again, local impacts of climate change vary significantly. And the, the, if we have just top-down planned adaptation, then I think there's a very real risk that you get what's called maladaptation, where some communities are negatively affected by efforts to uh, adapt. So what role should blended finance play in all of this? Well, if you look at the UNAP uh, estimates for adaptation costs, um, right now we are, we are getting a fifth to a seventh of what will be required for adaptation. So clearly we're going to need to move from a grant-based system to a um, a, a, a more credit-based system or a system that um, crowds in private capital to help. And it will that will essentially be done in three ways. One, leverage. Secondly, reducing the uh, average cost of capital. And then thirdly, reducing risk. So when you look at that, um, there are a series of instruments that are well known to the sort of uh, catalytic finance uh, people. Um, you know, for each of these categories, and in some cases, um, in overlapping categories. And I think that we need to sp spend quite a bit of time looking at, at this and how, and working with the big multilateral funds to think through how we can use blended finance to seriously leverage um, the funds that uh, are being given by uh, the the richer countries, and we know that those 
funds are a too little and b you know in many cases um are, are are being promised but not delivered we are going to have to find ways of amplifying their impact and i think that uh, blended finance could play a very very important role the other area which i think has been underexplored and we need to do a lot of work on and i think this is where the cfar alliance can play a particularly important role is to look at the role that digital technology can play to optimize and scale locally led adaptation we have a growing array of um digital uh, uh services and technologies that could play a key role in facilitating not just the planning process, but also implementation and indeed the, the governance and monitoring of these of these plans. So obviously, you know, when we're planning, we could crowdsource data, we could um, have IVR and voice based surveys, we could we could um, deploy community based sensors and, and leverage citizen science. Um, Clearly, the satellite and drone data would be very valuable. There are some great um, startups and, and techs that are providing local weather alerts that will be important. As Eric mentioned, mobile ma money services can play a really, really important role, um, as can digital record keeping, uh, not just for financial services, but more broadly. And then finally, of course, there is a growing move towards uh, trying to figure out how carbon credits can be uh, deployed um, and hopefully at much lower cost because right now around about 40% of carbon credits go to the audit and accreditation process. And we need to get to a situation where that is, you know, much, much lower percentage. So that the real value goes to the, the people creating, uh, you know, the farmers and, and the people who deserve the, the carbon credits. Now, all of this is good, but as Eric pointed out, many of these vulnerable communities don't have access to smartphones or are uncomfortable using them and so on. And I think that um, this is where the role of a variety of outreach agents um, could play a very important uh, role. Now, that might be international NGOs like CARE that are make, you know, doing um, community-based outreach. It might be microfinance organization staff it could be agricultural extension officers, um, or it could even be cash in cows, cash out agents of um, uh, mobile money or bank uh, operators. But the issue will be that these people need to be uh, well trained and conversant and comfortable with digital technologies so that we get the best out of them in the context of locally led adaptation. And that's something we need to work on and learn about a great deal more. Now, as a final slide, I just want to suggest that there are really important synergies between locally led adaptation and financial services. Because if we're able to pull down both international and national climate funds, as well as the international impact funds through blended finance instruments, to deliver to the various types of organizations that are delivering financial services to these vulnerable communities, then um, their question is going to be, how do I manage risk? And if we have a digitized approach to locally led adaptation, then we're going to be able to provide a lot of the data that those financial institutions need in order to uh, response to the needs for financial services um, in those vulnerable communities. Because the one thing that they lack at the moment is that ability to have the data to manage the risk. And therefore, you know, uh, as, as Eric, I'm sure, will attest, um, you know, these, these communities are underserved, if not completely unserved, by, um, by these uh, financial institutions. And I think that uh, digitally enabled locally led adaptation gives us the potential to redress that balance, particularly if some of the risk of lending into these more risky environments and communities is mitigated with blended finance. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Arjan um, and uh, have him talk through 
next steps and then once he's done that we will open up for questions and comments Arjan, over to you yes thank you graham so uh, i'll just give you a, a flavor of some of the things that we've planned uh, uh, that for the next couple of months um we will begin by um trying to recruit new members um to join this particular sort of convening and group uh, and there are a couple of key um, stakeholders that we're interested in. Um, so uh, some of the organizations uh, that we are intending to target uh, so that they can come and start you know, sharing their learnings and their expertise in advancing uh, locally led adaptation approaches include um, NGOs and NIGOs like CARE, for example, and, and national NGOs. We're trying to see um, whether we can uh, attract uh, organizations like UNCDF. In particular, they have a very long running project called the Locale Project that provides uh, uh, performance-based grants to uh, local governments, municipalities across many of the LDCs. Uh, we're trying to see if we can uh, recruit um, some microfinance institutions, for example, that, uh, that work directly with um, the kinds of uh, communities and individuals that we're interested in. Uh, we're also interested in uh, broader development finance institutions. Um, so this is both from, from uh, Northern sort of donor led DFIs, but also increasingly important are national level uh, development finance institutions. For example, in India, uh, uh, organizations like NABARD uh, are very, very important. Um, and then finally, uh, we're, we're quite keen to ensure that we um, bring in some of the digital technology providers um, and, and bring in uh, some uh, industry leaders and think tanks uh, as part of this group. Uh, the second phase uh, of this um, is to really uh, test and build on the work that has happened around participatory locally led planning uh, based on some of the findings from, from the working paper that Graham just presented, uh, but also building on the expertise and knowledge of a myriad of um, organizations across um, different geographies that have been working on, uh, uh, you know, working with different, different communities to do uh, locally led planning. It's quite clear that there needs to be a, a serious step change in how we plan and um, our capacity to be able to meet uh, the, the needs uh, in the next couple of years around, around climate. So we're quite keen to sort of ramp up um, this work on, on uh, participatory locally led planning processes. Um, the third element of our learning agenda uh, <clears throat> will focus on um, expanding our, our knowledge and our uh, you know, um, case studies of how we can best use uh, blended finance instruments uh, to uh, enable locally led adaptation finance of, of all for sort of leveraging, uh, using public finance to leverage additional private finance for adaptation at the local level for reducing risk, as well as for decreasing the cost of, of capital. Uh, and decreasing um, interest rates uh, for these kinds of activities. And then finally, um, uh, and, and ideally um, we would like to recruit you know, different organizations across all of, all of the, the three areas that we want to focus on. But I think the last one in particular, we're quite keen to, to do this jointly with other CPR members, is to start building out uh, an inventory of digital tools uh, and methods that could aid in uh, advancing locally led adaptation um, along the lines of uh, the the part the slide that Graham just showed on on different uh, locally led uh, technologies um, or digital technologies that could aid uh, locally led adaptation. So so that was it in terms of sort of you know what we're planning to do in the next couple of months and we're we're very keen to develop partnerships and ensure that 
you know, we're not the only ones that are interested in these activities and that we bring on board um, your organizations and, and the work that you're doing uh, to ensure that we're able to drive uh, some of these agendas that we think are quite critical. Great. Thanks so much, Arjun. Um, Thank so you. let me now open it up for uh, conversation, questions, comments, and uh, wisdom from the collective that is on the call. Not all at once, one at a time. I guess I'll go board. ahead. This is this is Liz McGinnis, and I'd like to know what role you see for um, industry leaders and think tanks joining uh, in your collab. That's a great question, Liz, and and thank you for it. Um, so, really, I mean, I, industry leaders and think tank is, of course, as you've guessed, a a catch-all. But I I think that it's. The way we're looking at this is that there have been some great starts on locally led adaptation, but we really need to accelerate this because across the globe, vulnerable communities are being impacted by climate change. And if we're going to make meaningful change for them, just top down national um, adaptation plans will will not um, will not cut it. And so, you know, but of course, Almost by definition, locally led adaptation is a, a you know a, a piecemeal um, exercise. You need to go into local communities and really work with them to understand their needs and um, go through that big planning process that, that we outline. So, um, bringing in industry leaders and think tanks, I think, is 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 designed to um, a guide us in terms of what has already been done because obviously we. Um, we're by no means first to the party, and there's lots to learn from other people. But secondly, also eventually to influence back up the the chain, so to speak, to um, really begin to um, map out ways that we can scale like locally led adaptation well beyond what's currently going on. Arjun, did you want to add anything to that, or is that does that cover it broadly? I think that's good, Bram, from my side. Okay, super. Looks like you have a question from Mary. Yeah, just double check before we go to Mary. Liz, does that answer your question or or not really? Please. Oh, yes, yeah, so that, that answers <laughs> it. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Graham. <laughs> thanks so much. Mary. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, my name, again, is Mary, uh, and I'm... Uh, coming in to this call from Kampala in Uganda. I am a lecturer at uh, uh, Makere University uh, here in Kampala, and I'm quite interested in what you just presented uh, right now, because we currently, as I speak, uh, have uh, been or are uh, having a consortium with a number of organizations, which include uh, the Ministry of Finance uh, here in Uganda, the Uganda Institute of Bankers and Financing uh, Institutions, uh, together with the uh, CBO. And what we are trying to do is to exactly test what you're trying to, uh, what you are saying, which is a blended financing solution for locally led adaptation. So um, we, we have been trying to bring together different partners to, to work around what could be done, and that's what um, excites me. But in addition, uh, we um, currently we are doing some research around the effectiveness of locally led adaptation interventions in East Africa. So we are working together with um, with uh, uh, an organization which is based in Nairobi, Kenya, uh, uh, under uh, funding or with funding from uh, from F. CDO. I, I'm not sure if our colleagues on this call are conversant with this organization, but it's the development arm of, um, of the British government. 
So we are doing this kind of um, effectiveness, you know, understanding the tech effectiveness of adaptation interventions around all of the nine countries in East Africa. And I, uh, so uh, at the end there, when the speaker mentioned about uh, creating partnerships, I was wondering like, how does somebody who wants to partner uh, with you, uh, as people like us who are in the same field trying, you know, to test out how these different solutions work, how can we partner with you? That's one thing. Secondly, I, oh, man, I saw, I, I see on the screen there, that uh, government is not one of the partners that you're looking at. And uh, I wanted to know uh, one, why uh, government is not there. Uh, but uh, secondly, to also say like in our case, uh, we think that uh, government it's, you know, because of uh, its wide reach, it's easy. Like in Uganda, for example, we have um, a model which is called the parish development model, which is really a bottom-up community planning development, you know, model where fi both financing resources um, and uh, decision making try to be devolved to the local people. And we are trying to build on this um, model, which is already being funded and, you know, scaled up by government and to see how as we researchers, we can try to tweak around it and, uh, and see if uh, it's possible to work through that to then um, catalyze private sector financing. I'm sorry I cannot say <laughs> everything here, but uh, I think in right. a nutshell what I'm saying is uh, we see that there is a lot of value in having government on board. So I want to know why uh, government is not included here and, uh, and also how uh, uh, organizations that would want to partner with you can do that and in which way. Thank you so much. So Mary, two really, uh, first of all, congratulations on your work and um, two really great questions. First, um, please reach out to me and my team and we'll be delighted to uh, collaborate and work alongside you. We have an office in Nairobi and actually work uh, extensively in Uganda and many of the other countries in the region. So I really, uh, you know, partnership, I think, can be really, really easy and um, uh, uh, yeah, please just reach out, out to me and um, I'll put you in touch with the right people. Um, in terms of government, that is a really good question. Um, and, and I think that, um, so just make an observation, a tip of hat to Uganda, which I think is ahead of many, many governments on this, um, because they have got really quite active work on locally led adaptation. We actually trained some of the local government officials in Uganda and were really impressed with how engaged they were uh, with these issues and how thoughtful they were. And of course, you've got um, UNCDS Locale, their, their sort of nexus is in Uganda itself. So, um, you know, I think Uganda is a really good example and, and, and a great place to be learning from. Um, but back to why we didn't have government on this list, I, 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 I don't think that there's any reason why we shouldn't. Uh, the question is whether government uh, officials, you know, have the time and energy to be involved in this type of, um, you know, collaborative arrangement. If you can steer us to government officials who you feel would have the time and energy to, to be involved, then, you know, obviously we'd be very interested in working with them as well. But I also like to defer to Eric a little bit on this because, you know, you deal with local government in many countries, Eric. What has been your experience? Oh, thanks, Graham. Um, so in particular in Uganda, I, I do have to say it, it is a lot easier to work with the government because this is an initiative that they're pushing. Um, we've seen that at uh, the community level, before programs engage with the uh, participants, we have to go through the CBOs or the, the CBD, what's it called? community development offices to explain what we're doing. And usually that allows you the opportunity to either layer what your program is about onto something that's being initiated or implemented by the government. And that 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 has been helpful. And they do take a, a you know, a, a very proactive approach to to in, engaging with partnerships. 
Um, so in Uganda, it's been very good. Uh, I'd say the same for Rwanda because of the way the district system is set up. You do have a lot of engagement with community development offices and the government um, government workers in in the, in in these districts. Um, I I do like the idea of you know having them as a partner because, as I mentioned earlier, one of the key things is to see how we can leverage the positioning of the government to like kind of influence the the policies around certain things that are creating you know roadblocks to to digital access or financial inclusion for for participants so like if there were ways to streamline uh cost around data and uh airtime if there are ways to mitigate, you know, transaction fees for for mobile money users in VSLA groups, for instance, these are all kind of the kind of policies we'd love to have the government participate in influencing. So that's something we're doing, and um, I, I think on the on the larger scale, if if you're looking at scaling programs around digital inclusion, financial inclusion, having the government. Um, participate in uh, the training and the rolling out of, you know, skilled workforces to to help um, build the capacity of the communities you're working in would be a very useful tool. So I, I agree with, with Mary and I like the fact that it, you guys are open to, to working with the government because it does play a big role in, in, in these kind of development projects. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Eric. No, I mean, I think working with government is absolutely essential. Just to repeat, I think, you know, generally the model for locally led adaptation is local government meets community representatives for a participatory planning process. Um, and and I, I, I think that that's super important. I don't, I don't think that communities will be able to do it on their own because adaptation does require investment in in collective infrastructure quite often which usually the local government is best positioned to uh deliver any other questions or comments Graham, this is arjun i i had a question for eric Uh -huh. uh, yeah, hi, hi, Eric. Um, I just wanted to understand a little bit how um, CARE is approaching um, sort of bringing together, you know, the, the work that you've done on, on VSLAs and digitizing the package with the work that it has gone on on um, sort of community-based adaptation and now uh, locally-led adaptation. What has been, you know, what has been your experience in using... VSLA type approaches in advancing uh, resilience at the local level. If you could speak to some of that, that'd be great. Um, so it's multiple layers to that. Um, for us, uh, the VSLAs have been like a very key or integral entry point into these communities. So usually what happens is once a program is launched and a VSLA in this local community adopts it, uh, it, it kind of trickles into the community like in a natural way. So with the, in, the introduction of um, digital literacy programs and you know, trying to find uh, asset financing for VSLA groups or for women to, to access devices, it's, it's also allowing other members of the community to start to understand that these are tools that are accessible to them. And naturally, when, 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 when women are taught anything, they tend to share that information with, with others. So like the VSLA group is not just a, a, a group of women coming to sit down and save. It's a place where people exchange stories, share struggles, and a lot of that community bonding and development is is what then leads to the 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 trickle down effect for for the programming. So we found that that's very helpful. It's 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 also like a little tricky because, as I said, there are very different um, personas in within the VSLA structures. 
So we, we broke it down into four particular uh, personas and realizing that it's not a one size fits all solution, especially when it comes to digital inclusion and, and financial inclusion, because everyone's needs are different. So we have to con contextualize situations to make sure that we're, we're focusing on the actual needs. So that's why we use the, the women respond uh, program to like get that, that direct feedback so that we're not just making up solutions that we feel are necessary. I, I, I like to use the example of like, I've seen a lot of ag programs where people talk about, we're going to be using drones to, to scout the land and plant the seeds. And yes, in some situations, that's very possible. But when you're looking at grassroots and rural communities, it, there's so many layers that we have to tackle before we get to the, the point that people are flying drones. So the digital literacy, the getting people comfortable with using certain, certain tools like smartphones, we found situations where you hand a smartphone to a group and people are hesitant to use it because they're unfamiliar with it. So like making sure that there's a level of comfort that's introduced to these groups to allow them to like to use these tools effectively is key. And then also like, again, back to that reference of the drone, making sure that the, that we're partnering with with innovators and private sector operators who are building tools that are very relevant. So we found, you know, like digitizing VSLA ledgers is one of the tools that has been seen to be relevant and VSLA groups are actively speaking about how this is helping them. We've had issues with, um, groups have issues with, you know, the share out process being too long because they have to go back through, you know, hundreds of paper records to do the calculations. And if there's a miscalculation, Tear outs could take as long as three weeks, but once they understand the value of using a digital ledger and how quickly this can be done, something that took three weeks can be done in half an hour and it's accurate. And everyone also has the access to their own information. So a lot of the digital ledgers might be built on smartphone technology, but have a USSD capability so that after the meeting, group members are able to receive an SMS showing them exactly how much is saved, how much went into the, the record so that everyone has equal opportunity to, to view and understand how this, this process works. So it's, it's uh, complicated. And I, I feel like I, my, my train of thought went too far and I might have lost some of your question, but I hope I answered some of it uh, in that ramble. Uh, yeah, but if I didn't, please ask again and I'll do do better. <laughs> Eric, that was great. I, I, I'd like to ask a supplementary question, though, which is, um, do you think that there's a role for, because we see in, in mobile money, for example, um, quite often um, uh, what I call agent-assisted work, you know, transactions being made. Is there, do you think, a role for the outreach agents that I talked about playing that. So rather than, you know, banging our heads against, um, uh, you know, how do we make this work uh, and the community do it themselves, is there a role for those outreach agents to provide assistance with those digital technologies? Yeah, absolutely. And um, we've seen in a lot of cases where uh, in rural communities where people are not so comfortable with the technology or the introduction of these tools, there are standout cases where you find uh, what we call digital champions. And those people become the people who train yeah. the other members of the group. And in, uh, I'll give an example for like uh, in Malawi, we found a program that has used mobile money and created a wallet that is specific to VSLA group um, practices. So any group members can join, start their own mobile wallet, and it's all digital, and it's all on USSD on feature phones. They've introduced asset financing to make sure that group members are able to afford the devices. And one thing that the group members brought up to us was that they still have to travel a certain distance to access a mobile money vendor. And as I was speaking to the, 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 the representative from the MNO, I was like, 
why aren't you training some of the VSLA group members to become mobile money vendors? And because there are clearly some digital champions among the group who want to become uh, mobile money agents and can provide this service and make this whole process more efficient for everyone. So we can see that by them, by the MNO tinkering that aspect of it, because the barrier for those, those, those women in these groups is they don't have the startup capital, but the group is already saving money on this mobile wallet and they're going to be doing all these transactions. So how do you utilize the fact that the money is being used by the group, it's being saved on your wallet, and there are some agents, some members of the group who could potentially become agents. Can we waiver the fee, the, the startup capital fee for them and create some sort of like um, financing mechanism that allows them to start the business and it'll allow the transactions to continue seamlessly? So there's so many different areas that we can leverage these relationships and not just on the, the transactions of mobile money, but also like the highlighting these agents to become trainers, to become agents and, 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 and continue the work that we're doing. We currently use community-based uh, trainers, but they're trained in so many different things. We don't want to have situations where we have these, these people who are, you know, jacks of all trades, but masters of none, when we could actually be using mobile money agents who understand this particular thing really well and skill them more to understand and leverage the VSLA group relationships to build a more sustainable system. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, let me open it up for any other questions. If not, I've got a follow up one, but I, I don't want to monopolize the conversation. So if anyone else has a question, please chime in now. Get my follow up question. Are there, um, are there examples within your system, Eric, of um, financing a community um, based enterprise or, or activity. So not individual lending within the VSLA, but as a as a group. And if so, how how's that? What's the experience been like? Because tradition, it's been problematic. Yeah, um, I can think of one particular example in Uganda where we had a VSLA group that uh, was doing, uh, they were making soap, uh, like detergent. And yep. what happened is once they started using mobile money, they realized that they were able to actually borrow from that mobile money account um, the amount that they had w within their savings, which was basically doubling their, their funds so that they could scale their business. And through that, their plan is to scale their business by encouraging other VSLA groups to now start developing the mobile, the soap as well, building, uh, making the same soap so they can start selling it as like a cooperative of VSLA groups. But the cool thing about this was this interaction started on WhatsApp. So like once they had access to smartphones, um, these groups are now starting to communicate with each other. And it, it's been very inspiring to watch because a lot of the time, a lot of our focus is on the financial inclusion aspect, but we, we, we miss the key element of like the communication aspect. So one of the things that we got as feedback from the groups who then got access to smartphones is like the communication aspect is so important to them. And by them being able to communicate with each other, these kind of enterprises can start to grow. So like they, they understand what group in other districts is doing and how they could leverage off that or who's doing something similar and how they can work together to build something bigger than what they have. So, I mean, it's it's cool. But yeah, the, the link to, to mobile money services did allow them to, to then get that easy access to capital because those loans are generally easier to access than a bank or a microfinance institution because it's based on what you have in your wallet. So yeah, that's that's been cool. Okay, many thanks. Jesse, over to you. Uh, thank you, Graham, and, and thanks, Eric. I mean, uh, and Wendy and Absentia and, and Ariane and all who, who joined us, I just, um, 
wanted to say um, how much uh, on behalf of the Super Alliance uh, Secretary, we really appreciate um, everyone taking the time to advance this conversation on this really critical topic for uh, adaptation and resilience and, and innovation at that nexus. Um, I've dropped into the chat um, some details on um, how you can continue to be engaged in the conversation and um, stay connected, obviously, to um, all of you who've been presenting and, and speaking and sharing your work today and asking questions um, and also the work of the CFAR Alliance and our um, 14 plus members and 90 organizations that are engaged in really critical knowledge building work um, in our collab. So just wanted to thank you again uh, to, to you, Graham, and, and to the speakers and to all of our participants for joining us today. I look forward to the next conversation. Many, many thanks indeed to all. And uh, anyone who wants to, I put my email address in the uh, chat, so feel free to reach out. Thank you so much. Bye-bye now. Thanks all. Go well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.